So good afternoon and hello everybody. Welcome to today's event, leveraging the power of social media influencers to combat COVID-19 misinformation among parents of unvaccinated youth. My name is Elizabeth Breidenbach. I'm a meeting and event specialist based in the clinical affairs division here at NAC and I'm pleased to bring you this event with my division colleagues. Before we get started, let's review a few housekeeping announcements. You have joined with this online event by either physically calling in or using computer audio. All attendee lines have been muted and will be muted for the duration of this live event. This live event is approximately 60 minutes, including introductions, presentations, and Q&A. Again, the duration of this live event is 60 minutes, including introductions, presentations, and Q&A. On your screen right here, we do have the chat box and gives you instructions. So we highly encourage you to use this throughout today's session. Thank you so much for the folks that have submitted questions in advance. We do have those in our back pocket for you today. If you'd like to ask a question, make a comment or concern during today's session, please use the chat box located in the lower right hand side of your computer screen, simply type your question and make sure you select the to everyone before hitting enter so we can get your comments, questions or concerns. If for some odd reason we cannot answer your question in the time allotted, we'll either make an attempt after the event has been completed or reach out to you directly. As a little icebreaker that I love to use is, um, so everybody knows where the chat box is, go ahead and use that chat box right now. Let us know maybe where you're working from today, what city and state, maybe your health center name. Just give us a quick shout let us know where you're coming from. Oop, I've got a few chat messages already. Thank you so much for that, folks. Friendly reminders that today event is being recorded and will be available for playback at a later event. All attendee lines have been muted and will be muted for the duration of this event. Again, please use that chat box throughout the duration of today's event located in the lower right hand side of your computer screen. At this moment, I'm going to turn things over to Lori, who's going to be introducing today's speakers and taking it from here. Lori, the floor is yours. Sure. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lori Agan with the Clinical Affairs Communications team. And so happy to have all of you join us for today's fantastic webinar. I'm super excited about it. Um, we have three wonderful panelists, all that are going to talk to you about influencer marketing. Our first uh, panelist is Maura Ahrens Mele. Um, she's the um, executive vice principal. Pres uh, uh, Vice President of Social uh, of the Social Impact Team at Gebbin Communications, and she will give you a general overview today of the of influencer marketing and its impact as part of a public health communications campaign. Well, she'll be followed by Alana Fernandez of um, a influencer um, and content creator who is um, um, owns and runs the Positive Mom blog. Uh, or um, social media um, pages. And then we've got Rama Kaida, um, who is the Senior Manager of Community Health at Whitman Walker, who will walk you through their um, influencer marketing program. So um, we'll just get started and I'll turn it over to Maura um, to begin. Oops, Maura, your line is muted. Um, can you hear me now? Absolutely. It would not be a webinar without someone <laughs> talking without while being muted. Anyway, let's start again. So I'm Maura. I'm so happy to be here with you today. I'm going to blaze through a lot of slides, but if you want to see them after, I'd love you to see them. I have been a blogger since 2005. I worked for many years with Blog Her, which was one of the original communities for women who blog. And I do this work as my day job because I truly, truly believe in the power of women's voices meeting social media. So we'll talk about that today. Next slide, please. Um, I got the inspiration to do this work um, for my company, Women Online, which is now part of Gebbin Communication, because I grew up in politics. And as someone who was trying to organize volunteers, I could never get working parents out at night. Why? Because we're busy, right? And so campaign offices would call and say, hey, can you come make phone calls? And working parents would say, no, I'm not coming at eight o'clock tonight to campaign headquarters to make phone calls. I have other things to do, like feed my kids, right? And the reason why online organizing is so powerful, whether it's engaging social media influencers, like we'll talk about today, or all the other tools that we now use, um, is because people can do it from their house. They don't have to break up their lives. And this is so, so important. 
um, when it comes to organizing parents who are super, super busy. Um, I'm seeing notes in the chat that people can't see slides. So I just want to stop and acknowledge that. Um, should I keep chatting? Go ahead and keep chatting. I'm going to take them down and re-upload them um, right this second. So. Okay, perfect. And so influencer marketing is a piece of this because influencers, the ones we're going to talk about today, are mostly busy parents themselves. And so having a program where you can reach influencers who are parents and their audiences who are parents is really, really important because people are so busy and they want to help. Helping from the internet is a great way to do it. So what is marketing? Influencer marketing is a channel of marketing. You'll hear often the term multi-channel marketing, right? And you probably do it at your health centers. Very few organizations except for like Target can afford to do all, next slide please, all marketing channels, right? Here we go. Um, like TV ads and a robust public relations campaign and search marketing and ads and mobile marketing, right? Most big companies do all of that. Most nonprofits can't, but we pick the channels that we market through anyway, right? We have a website. We probably do some targeted media relations. We send out emails to our lists. We're on social media. We're worrying about how we look in search, et cetera. Next slide, please. Influencer marketing is a channel of marketing, and it's a piece that you should be incorporating into your programs. Who's an influencer? Influencers are people who have developed a reputation for expertise, right? They create content online and they build up, as Alina will tell us, properties on social media with audience. People trust influencers. And the cool thing about when organizations partner with influencers is it like, it's like the organization is borrowing the platform from the influencer. All of you know who are out there in the field trying to build audience, trying to get people's attention, trying to get people to open your emails, trying to buy ads. Yay, slides! <laughs> um, actually, let's go back to the marketing channel slide because I have a feeling a lot of people didn't see that, if you wouldn't mind going back. I just think it's helpful to get oriented and you can see in your own center which channels you may use or in previous jobs, right? At the center, you probably have your campaign content that might be housed on a website, that might be in person, it might be a video, it might be written material, and then you use channels to market it, right? Influencer marketing is one of those channels. You can see it down here at the right next to partner organizations. Next slide. Um, as I was saying, the thing that's really important for brands and especially nonprofits about influencer marketing is that it's hard to build audience. A lot of times we don't have the budget. We don't have the resources like graphic designers or copywriters. We don't have the time to invest in buying and building an audience online. And with influencer marketing, what you're doing is you're asking an influencer to share your content to their audience. So it's a built in audience and it's really cost effective. It's trusted and it's powerful. And I'm going to tell you a little bit why in an area of information asymmetry, like vaccine promotion, it's so important to borrow someone else's audience rather than try to build up your own. Types of influencers. You know, I hate typing anything. Alina is going to talk a little bit more about um, micro influencers and the work she does with parenting influencers but it's helpful to think about influencers and in categories you might think of the mega celebrities we all file we all follow like on instagram and TikTok, with millions of followers or more than a hundred thousand and then if you're thinking about your local audience you might want to look at nano influencers who are people you know who might have a thousand followers they might have five thousand followers but they have a following in your neighborhood, in your area, in your city, in your topic, and that's really important. Influencers work across all platforms. Again, Alina's going to talk a little bit more about that, so I'm not going to spend too much time. But it's also interesting when you're thinking about vaccine communications to think about the platforms where your audience specifically hangs out and where people are going to get health information. And the truth is, these days, it's across all platforms. And finally, topic and focus. Again, as we talk about audience, we'll think about what does that influencer tend to focus on? A lot of influencers write about everything or create content around everything, but most have a specific focus that they like to talk about. And it can be something really super specific, 
or it can be something a bit broader like parenting. Next slides, please. Whenever I think about engaging influencers, I always think about what I call the what's in it for me. And this is really, really important. Um, influencers are professionals. They create content and a lot of them earn their living that way. And so they offer their platforms to you. That's important. They've spent a lot of time and money building up that audience and you need to compensate them. Nonprofits sometimes do not pay influencers directly. They can compensate influencers in other ways. I think it's really important to remember what I call the what's in it for me. How is that influencer benefiting their audience, their editorial calendar, and their programming by collaborating with you? Now, sometimes it's enough to help society. <laughs> when you think about my first slide and trying to recruit parents to come down and make campaign phone calls, people want to help. Influencers are people too, and we all care about a panoply of issues. We care about public health. But because this is our profession, we like when we're asked to be an expert. We like when we're asked to partner with a local authority. It makes us feel good. It makes us feel like the sort of maven that we are. And that's part of the what's in it for me. So when you're thinking about working with influencers, either think about compensation through money or compensation through another way. Next slide, please. Why is influencer marketing great with public health? The truth is, is that influencers are validators, right? Influencers are people who have built up audience for a reason because other people listen to them. I think of influencer marketing in a public health campaign as enhancing the sometimes, you know, sterile and overly scientific messaging that we can create out of organizations and bringing in sort of a personal touch and a personal rep, rep like rep, personal rep, reputation, sorry, tripping on words here. I like to think of influencer marketing in public health, like bringing in another third party trusted voice, like a local doctor, a community leader, a trusted educator, a mentor, right? It's part of the choir that you want pushing your message in public health. Influencers also understand their audience. After all, it's their job to build an audience. And so they can really help create great storytelling, and they can drive social media metrics, which again, is something that nonprofits don't always have time to do. And the truth is influencer marketing has always existed. I'll never forget when I worked at the American Cancer Society and their archives were filled with old fashioned influencers who used to be women who knocked on people's door, informing the public about cancer and passing the word. And that's what we do as influencers today. Next slide. Why are influencers, oh, jump back one if you don't mind. Why are influencers so powerful against public health? Well, all the reasons we've just discussed, plus algorithms reward powerful social media content. Algorithms like visuals, they like content that a lot of people click on and react to. And facts don't always matter on the internet. As we know, and you've probably read this elsewhere, there's historic low distrust in institution, which gives perceived power to influencers. I've been following the Novak Djokovic news just voraciously. It's such a classic example of how vaccine misinformation when picked up by social media can fuel so much mis and disinformation. And I've pulled a couple examples from Serbian media where you can see influencers on Facebook and Instagram using powerful videos, claiming things like, you know, Bill Gates is conspiring with Federer and Nadal against Djokovic to spread COVID. And um, it's a plot against the Serbian government. So you can see we're up against it every single day. And I don't need to tell you that. Next slide. In vaccine world in particular, we are sort of years behind a very organized, although much smaller group of anti-vaxxers. There's a true asymmetry of information and passion on social networks, right, when it comes to fighting the anti-vaxxers. They're very well organized. They monitor claims. They monitor information that can be manipulated. And frankly, they're just more mobilized than the silent majority who is pro-vaccine. It comes to back to those busy parents. As you know, most parents are pro-vaccine, but they are not going to take an hour out of their day to shout out misinformation 
on the internet. And that is actually where influencer marketing is really powerful because you want to borrow the engaged audience of an influencer and try to get your scientifically accurate pro-vaccine information out there where it has a chance of competing against anti-vax content. The other powerful thing is that you want to try to reach parents through Google rankings and index on other people's content and having other influencers write about you on their websites, on their blogs, in their social media is a really good way to become visible in a way that would cost you as a nonprofit organization a lot of time and money to do. Next slide. Huh. So where do we start? And I'd love to hear your examples and I am looking forward to it. I think the first thing is to ask influencers for help. In my work doing vaccine promotion with leading parent influencers across the country, people want to help. They want to get information out there, but they need your support as organizations that can be trusted. So it's not a question of just sending someone a note and saying, will you tweet this for me? You have to provide access to experts, hopefully graphics and information that's easy, di easily digestible or that influencers can digest and create graphics on their own. Allow influencers to use their own voice and storytelling skills to amplify your fact-based messages. They know their audiences best. And so even if you may want to control for science, controlling for content is not always the best idea. And I'm sure Alina has a lot of views on that. And then this is the most important thing, and trust me, I have learned this the hard way. When you're asking influencers to join you in a campaign, especially when it comes to promoting vaccines, you need to stay with them. They might get comments that are negative. They might get hit with rampant misinformation that they can't combat on their own because they're not experts. Your job there, much as you would when you're working with local media or any other validator, is to be there and back them up. Next slide. I'm going to jump through this slide because I'm running out of time. Next slide. Let's just look quickly at the basics when you're thinking about building an influencer marketing program. On the left side of the screen, or my left, stage left, is sort of the big metrics that I think you'd apply to any marketing or communications effort that you were taking on. And then we'll get to the specifics, assets, and ask to influencers and timeline and budget. Um, next slide, please. For everything that you take on, there should be a strategy behind that, right? And influencer marketing is no different. It's really important to think about the audience that you want to mobilize. You may want to mobilize everyone in your city, but that probably isn't possible. So think about who you ideally want to see coming in your center, taking an action. In the case of childhood vaccines, it's probably parents, right? It's parents of children who are in school, who are obviously very, very online, mostly, and getting hit with a lot of information, pro and con. Most of the parents that you probably want to reach are vaccine neutral, which, mean, which means that they have to be convinced and they're probably getting hit with misinformation. And so you need to think about compelling content that is going to turn them the other way. But you might want to reach parents who are information seeking, who are asking those hard questions, who basically trust doctors and professionals, but just lead a little nudge, right? So that's a kind of snapshot of an audience that you might want to reach. Goals with influencer marketing campaigns are probably similar to the goals that you'd have with any one of your communications campaign, right? You want to get the right news out there. <laughs> you want people to engage. You want people to share. You might want to reach a local parenting group, infiltrate an event, right? Or you might just want to show strength in numbers. You might want to be able to say to your board, we had X many hundreds or thousands of people click on this link or share this hashtag or clicks to our website, we're up a certain percentage, right? And that can be a totally valid goal. I always ask clients to think about what success looks like. Again, it sounds really basic, but before you embrace a campaign, no campaign is going to do everything for you think about what success really looks like in public health ultimately we want to change in behavior right we want more jabs and arms but again sometimes you have to start smaller so you might want to think about the digital metrics that you want if you want more mentions online or links inbound to your site visits forum signups really drill down and think about what success is going to look like when you report it back 
or you might want to call for increased foot traffic into your center. And that would include creating a different call to action for your campaign. Next slide. Okay, so nitty gritty. When you think about reaching out to influencers, again, think about the what's in it for me, for them, and think about what the campaign is actually going to look like. What can you offer them in terms of assets, right? They have to have something to say, something to share. Can you offer them an expert, one of your doctors or a center leader to interview? Can you create graphics or even simple talking points that then they can create into graphics? Is there a landing page? Is there a website? Is there some place that you can ask influencers to send their audiences to, right? You need a call to action to create a successful campaign. Or you might be promoting an event, right? Or a vaccine wagon or a webinar, whatever it is, have a good sense of what you can offer the campaign, um, what you can offer people to share about the campaign. And that leads you into the ask, right? It's really important when working with influencers who are busy and managing a lot of asks, you're the client, right? And you want to tell them what to do. Are they sharing info? Are they sharing talking points? Are they asking their audiences to get vaccinated and then share a selfie? We've seen that a lot and it's been successful. Are you asking them influencer to post an image and ask their audience to like it? Think about your own social media usage and again, what success looks like. So you can put together an ask for your influencer. And then finally, how much time do you need to go out and find the influencers to recruit them and give them all the information they need to take your campaign and run with it? Do you need to design assets, build that into your timeline? How long do you want the campaign to run, right? Are you asking influencers, I'll show you in a sec, to post three times, four times, two times. Think about how long you want that flight to be. And, a call, and of course, the budget, right? Every campaign is going to have some sort of budget. If you're paying your influencers, if you are paying for resources like graphic design or building in staff time or other human resources. Next slide. Recruiting, this is the fun part. And I would argue, and I'd love to hear um, from folks in centers later, but I think that having relationships with local influencers is just as important with, as having relationships with local media or with other validators who you're using, who you're engaging in the community, right? Influencers are people who probably, if you're looking locally, live in your community too. And honestly, there's no magic. There's lots of software that you can use and it's expensive, but I would recommend with just starting with searching, right? You can search on Google and Twitter on platforms, thinking about the hashtags that local influencers might use, right? The city that you're in, asking around and thinking about again about your own life. When you're looking to try a new restaurant in your area, who do you seek out on social media? Is that someone? If you're part of a parenting group, are there influencers who lead that group? Think about your own life as well and start building relationships. Um, Boston Mamas is a blog that has been around in Boston forever run by Christine Co. She, she works with me day to day, but I knew her because she was the website that I went to when I wanted to find cold weather things to do with my toddler. Um, and so I, get, I guarantee that your city has an equivalent. Next slide. Pricing. Um, we can talk about this in discussion. Most influencers have rate sheets. Um, I think it's really, really important and where I've seen campaigns fall down is when expectations aren't clear. So it's important to think about if you're paying an influencer, what exactly are you paying for? Is there an anchor piece of content like a blog post and then you're asking the influencer to share it? Are you asking them to make a video and then share it? Really be extra crystal clear on what expectations are because that's really important. Um, we often have clients sign a memorandum of understanding with influencers that a lot outlines who owns copyright, et cetera, et cetera. That is not necessary, but every center will have a different guidance and you might want to check with a lawyer, you know, if, if that's how your center rolls. I wanted to throw in a note here about adding in money for boosting social media. Won't paying influencers diminish their credibility? No, and we can talk about that during conversation. Thank you, Rich, for your comment. Um, 
I think that um, what we do is we um, provide influencers extra budget. And even if you're not paying them, we provide them budget to boost their posts through ads on social media platforms, because this is a way of really amplifying content. Um, as much as um, I love to talk about how bad the platforms like Facebook's role is in spreading misinformation, the truth is most of us need them because that's where audience is. And advertising through Facebook especially is so effective that you could talk with influencers that you're engaging about building in a little bit of extra budget. Again, I've, I've shown here a hundred bucks a day, uh, sorry, a hundred bucks for three days, you know, not a ton of money, but it will really drive extra eyeballs. Next slide. And finally, measurement. Um, again, everyone measures differently and depending on how um, complex your operation is, you might have software that measures or not. But at the very least, ask your influencers to use a hashtag because that's an easy, low cost way to track success. You can also track your own Google Analytics and your own site metrics, right? And you can ask influencers to self-report, use and engagements on the posts that they create, for example, on Instagram. I think that's it for me. Helena? Thank you so much. That was so amazing, Maura. And I am really happy to be here and talk about mom influencers because I am one. Uh, next slide, please. So this is um, a little history of who I am in one slide. I am very passionate about public health. Uh, and it all started when I grew up uh, in a slum and seeing that the lack of sanitation and public health access um, growing up and seeing many preventable diseases taking my friends and family, um, which always makes me a little emotional. But just to give you a little background about me, uh, I'm also a cancer survivor. So I'm very passionate about preventing that as well. And I am a mom of four and four girls, they are 19, 18, eight and two. So all over the place. <laughs> and um, I uh, have, you know, been through a lot of trauma. So I'm very outspoken, outspoken when it comes to advocacy and prevention. And some of the campaigns that I have partnered with Gavin with and Mora knows this is, you know, cancer prevention through HPV and also um, with ACEs, which is something that I, is very near and dear to my heart and most recently vaccination against COVID as well, because I really believe that it's something that that all of us have a responsibility to amplify in this world and you know not just nationally so i'm really passionate about these topics and that's why i'm really excited to be here you can probably hear my kids playing in the background <laughs> and um next slide please so i've been an influencer for 18 years so i started in 2004 <laughs> which is crazy i heard the, that more i started in 2005 so we're probably the og influencers here and I've partnered with a lot of brands over 400 and so um, next slide please I am a micro influencer like Maura was saying and that goes from 10,000 followers to about 50,000 or a hundred thousand uh, we are not celebrities we are not journalists uh, some of us are writers uh, because we love to write, uh, I'm one of them. And some of them just write because it's part of being an influencer or maybe they just have social media channels and not a blog like I do. Um, and we are not experts in public health. I think Maura was very clear about that. Um, we are simply passionate about these topics and we like to talk about that. And I became an influencer uh, or a blogger actually uh, there was no Facebook, there was no Instagram at that time, but I became a blogger because of something really hard that I was going through becoming a single mom and, and wanting to express my feelings and reach other moms and really share my struggles uh, with other moms and, and also give some hope and share my journey. So that's how it all started. And since then, I've been 
refining and fine tuning my strategy. Um, and the three topics that I love to talk about is mindset, being a mom entrepreneur, and also motherhood, which is every aspect of being a mom. Um, with being a, an influencer, we have different roles. We are storytellers. So you always want to look for someone that tells a story because story is going to engage. Uh, we are community builders. We're always seeking for people that think and act and and are like us, but also trying to sell our ideas to to the audiences that we reach. And uh, you always want someone who's highly engaging because even though we have a lower reach compared to the celebrities and the journalists of main publications, we actually engage our audiences and they know, like, and trust us because we share authentic content. And this content, I always recommend that it be uh, evergreen content. So something that can always be relevant. So even though we have a COVID vaccine outreach right now, that it can also apply to future uh, campaigns and future um, uh, in uh, initiatives that we're um, going for. And um, when you're looking for a micro influencer, I always say someone that reaches your intended audience, because for example, I have two teenagers. However, most of my audience are parents of children from three to eight. So even though my daughter, my middle daughter is, you know, eight right now, but uh, you want to look for who's reaching that audience that you are looking to serve or to speak to. And uh, two components that I think are really important are the personality and passion of the influencer. And when you engage someone that is passionate about the topic that you're talking about, they're going to be more excited to share it and the, it's going to come out in the pieces of content that they create because they're going to be more engaging. Next slide, please. So content creation. So one of the things that I look for when I'm creating content is number one, does it match what I want to talk about? My three main pillars of my blog. Number two, is it something that is going to be helpful? And when I partner with someone, I want it to be helpful for three audiences, my partner, myself, because it serves my purpose and my passion and my audience. So it has to be a, like what I call a win, win, win. And when more I was saying, you know, what's in it for me, that's part of what's in it for me when I partner with our organization or any organization is, you know, how is this going to be fulfilling for myself and exciting to write about? And I'm going to have that passion, not something that I'm going to dread writing <laughs> and that uh, or feel maybe unsure about. Uh, but also, you know, are they going to get what they're compensating me to do? That's really important for me. Um, and also, even though it may be something that I'm passionate about and I'm getting compensated and they're going to get the results, it has to be helpful for my audience because ultimately that is the main success. That's how my blog is going to continue to get going. That's how the partner is going to actually read their met reach their metrics or their KPIs because they're also going to be able to engage with that audience because they find it helpful. They find it engaging. They find it interesting. Um, and I like to look at what's trending. I like to look at what is something that uh, people are searching for on online. I have SEO metrics and tools, and that means that I'm looking at what people are looking for in Google, what people are talking about on Instagram. So I love to research and see about that. I usually have a content calendar that is per year. So I'm looking to see what themes I can talk about, for example, you know, Martin Luther King Day was yesterday, so I already had a plan for what was going out that day. And obviously, you know, things that I'm passionate about. So that's how I choose content. The types of content could be written, could be visual or motion, 
or could be video. And with video, um, it could be a live video or it could be a broadcast of something that was pre-recorded. And um, I usually like to, to use my personal stories. I also use aggregation or roundups. And that means that you're looking for things like lists or maybe quotes or maybe things that other people are saying and you're aggregating it and you make a post out of that. And also collaborations like with centers like yours, that would be a paid campaign. That would be a campaign that will have a different uh, structure than something that I'm writing just for myself because I'm going to follow guidelines and I'm going to look for guardrails and I'm going to be reporting and measuring differently than when I write for myself. And um, the sources for my for my content are usually research, like I said before, uh, branded content. So I'm, I'm looking at what angle I could potentially share when I have a collaboration, uh, and then I'm going to also include my story on that. And personal experience, so uh, like I shared before a little bit about myself, those are stories that I incorporate on my blog, and I like to use my personal stories, but also stories that I know that other moms are going through and that share with me my community. I've been doing it for many years, so I get a lot of comments and even private messages and emails that tell me what other moms are looking for or maybe what their hesitations are, what their goals are, what uh, things are really, um, you know, bothering them or what they would like to see, what questions they have. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so I wanted to include some best practices that I've seen work when when other um, when when somebody reaches out to me, and the first one is research. So, for example, you know, um, I don't drink coffee. So when a brand that and I have that on my page, <laughs> and so when a brand reaches out to me to partner with a coffee brand, then you know I know that they didn't do their research. So you always want to look at the influencer and look at, at who they are and if they're, you know, compatible uh, with what you have. Um, and that also uh, goes with the audience, you know, do they reach the intended audience and do they talk about the topics that, that you want them to talk about? Um, I have what is called a Dream 100 list. And that means, you know, making a list of your top dream 100 people that you would like to partner with and then go from there. It doesn't have to be 100, but I always have a wish list uh, and curate those people and make sure that, that they're right for you. I would say to partner with storytellers because uh, people resonate with stories. Uh, they resonate with personal experiences. They want to know something real that somebody else is going through, somebody else knows about um, somebody else maybe doesn't know about. So a personal experience is always really important, whether a video, a visual story or written word. Um, and like Maura said, you want to look for someone that is aligned um, and they have the right voice and the right values. So even though they may not be people that are actively Pro vaccine, you know that their values are going to align with what you want to represent because they are representing your community and your uh, organization when they're speaking and when they're adding your hashtag, when they're tagging you as a partner, which is one of the best practices, then you want to make sure that that represents what you wanted to represent and that it's in alignment with them because you could have guidelines, but if that's not true to who they are and the kind of messages that they've been putting out to their audiences, there's going to be a disconnect and there's going to be less engagement. Um, advocacy friendly. We talked about that. I talked about this because 
I am an advocate of many things. <laughs> and I see that, you know, when you have someone that has practiced advocacy before, they know that there's backlash coming and they're not afraid of that back backlash. They're, they know that they are going to get this and they have partnered with you. I love what Maura said because, you know, in some of the campaigns that we've worked together, having that support of an expert that can give the right answer is really valuable. It's really amazing. And uh, having a niche that is about health is not or wellness is not necessarily that important uh, because if we have a storyteller, they can share on their platform, no matter what they usually share. So one of the things that we're really good at as content creators is that we find an angle for any product or any service or any idea uh, that relates to our story. And so you want to not discard somebody because maybe they are a type of blogger, um, but you just want to look at that their audience is relevant to you, that they have high engagement, and they that they provide quality content that people resonate with and that is helpful to them. And when you're working with an influencer, I think that it's important to have an application form or some kind of uh, mechanism that lets them know, um, lets you know that they're interested and you uh, when you provide clear MOU or SOW um, statement of work and information that provides everything that they need and the mutual expectations, I think that there's more formality and clarity and it's more professional. And also, if there are any questions, then that is going to come up. One of the things that I, I think is valuable with this type of work uh, especially in public health, is to require a draft. Um, and that way you can make sure that everything was understood properly um, and that both parties agree in the voice and, and the manner in which something is being communicated. Um, I found that very valuable so that I am, you know, staying true to my voice and my message, but also staying true to the actual good that I want to do in the world, uh, and that's going to be provided by by you experts um, and collaboration. I think that keeping the lines of communication open. I love when I'm partnering with a brand, and I can call them, and I can email them, and I can send a message and ask for support and clarification, and to know that they can that they can respond quickly. Um, that they are going to uh, approve the drafts promptly or keep communicating in the process. And also, um, like Maura said, you know, when somebody has a budget to add boost or, or create an ad around my content, but also they're going to share all their platforms, is another way of compensation uh, because it's going to amplify my content as well. So that's that's you know something that i'm very passionate about um because it it really truly feels like we're helping one another and that we are really providing that support um and it gives also another opportunity for me to share the content again if you know some <clears throat> something comes up and i was featured on this page, then I can share it again as another type of news without the content feeling stale, like you, you already share this again. Um, and so those are the, the main things that I think are, are helpful uh, or have been helpful for me. And people approach me uh, in many different ways. They find me on Instagram. I think that's the most popular way right now is when they go through a hashtag and find me on Instagram and send me a quick message and then send me an email so that we can continue the, the communication that way. Um, I really love that, but I also love email, you know, formal email. I'm a very, I'm an email person, but a DM is always a quick way that you can make a quick connection and then follow up and they can follow up if they're, if they're interested. And I think you can gauge the interest level that way as well, um, because 
uh, not everybody's going to check their DMs every day, but they're gonna also reply to you and communicate quickly if they are interested. Um, I think that the main thing for me uh, in working with brands is to have always a respectful approach, a very courteous approach. Uh, and I think that being afraid to kind of approach one another is usually the main obstacle. But I think if we do it in a natural way and just expecting that it's gonna be a, a, a seamless experience, it's gonna be great. I have said no to collaborations before, obviously, but I always do it in a gracious manner and try to connect the brand with someone that I know is going to be a good fit. So even if you approach somebody, is maybe, it's not a good fit, um, you know, it's not the end of, of all, you know, maybe they don't have a story that, that applies to that, but in another campaign, you can keep those, um, that communication open to work together. Um, and that's it, I would like to, you know, I want to respect my time and, and also I'll be available for the Q&A. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. So I see we're kind of short on time here. Such great content. Um, my name is Ramatulai Keita, and I am a senior manager over at Whitman Walker Health. So I'm just going to kind of walk you through a little bit about our current social media program, what we focus on, um, some marketing strategies that we have, and how we build our team. So just to quickly let you know, Whitman Walker Health is um, an FQHC that has been uh, leaders in the fight against um, HIV with a special expertise in LGBTQIA health since 1978. Through um, education prevention and diagnosis and treatments, we've really um, been dedicated to our populations and our communities and fighting um, and doing a lot of the prevention work that we do and we continue to do and we continue to grow. So in that in that growth fact, we did develop a social media outreach program. Health outreach is one of our um, most prominent ways of approaching this public health and approaching to approaching our goal of ending the HIV AIDS epidemic um, by 2030, which is the national goal. So with that, our social media program, I will tell you a little bit about it and you can ask questions and hopefully you'll all have access to these slides. So our social media influencer programs, um, our goal, <clears throat> is to ensure that um, our social media presence aligns with our mission and um, folks have access to Whitman Walker Health um, services and access to honest, to take care of their own health and really normalizing sexual health and preventative health. Um, so it's extremely important to ensure that there are community members who are trusted and committed to the space and already um, familiar faces within the community that we are trying to reach. Our priority populations are youth, um, MSM and men of sex with men and um, black and brown folks, um, LGBTQIA folks and folks throughout um, wards five, seven and eight. And Whitman Walker also provide an overall service and a holistic approach to healthcare. Honestly, healthcare that is representative of the person that we're serving, a healthcare that removes the barriers to um, that power dynamic that's typically seen between um, a provider and client and really removing that barrier and letting you know that you are in charge of your health. So that is, we carry that message on over to our social media platforms and we inc to increase engagement with our current community, which includes, of course, diversifying our audiences and um, our media posts, um, of course, to bring more traffic into our accounts because we do have um, as the trusted members in the community since 1978 we do have a baseline but as we continue to grow we want to be able to reach our um all of our populations in by diversifying the way we present outreach there isn't one way to present healthcare, which um as you could, during COVID-19, we saw that as we transitioned into the telehealth model too so it's important to ensure that folks have a buffet of ways to access their health care and understand that the power lies within them to really um, to empower them and support them in achieving their optimal health goals. And social media has like, helped us with that. 
Um, we choose micro influencers again as a way to meet our program goals and because there are already community members, trusted community members are delivered information. So it doesn't similar to the person's, um, it doesn't feel robotic. It does not feel forced as the question asks, oh, paying and influencers is that kind of diminished information that they're sending out? Well, these are our influencers, our community members who have already volunteered with Whitman Walker, who are involved in the work that we do, who support the work that we do, and on their own platforms prior to the social media um, campaign developing in about two years of Whitman Walker, they were already a presence. So it's a really um, authentic space for them to story tell. So as Whitman Walker staff, we support them in providing the educational component to what sexual health looks like to them so that they're appealing to their audiences and engaging folks and just normalizing the access to health care and removing those barriers. And micro influencers, believe it or not, do have a higher engagement at times than folks that you see with 20K followers. Um, 200K followers, if you check the engagement, which are analytics that you can find in um, Instagram. A lot of organizations or programs believe it's uh, external that um, to pull this data, but Instagram has built this in for us. So access and analytics and engagement and reach is free on all social media platforms. It's there. It's just a matter of utilizing um, those resources that are available to you. And a lot of micro, a lot of micro um, influencers have a special specialized niche. Not that that is the only place. What that's the only topic you have to stick to. But your audiences already know what to expect from you. So they're they're there and they trust the content that you're delivering. So we partner with them to build upon the information that they've already that they're already providing in their spaces and kind of provide like the access and the resources, the next step for folks connecting to care or preventive care or just having simple conversations, addressing medical mistrust, um, especially if you think about um, the COVID-19 vaccine. So that's, it's important for our, for it to be authentic. Our, our um, influencers bring those conversations to their platforms and we support them with the factual and the, um, <clears throat> the literal aspects of that. Next slide, please. So we have throughout the year, we have several, several um, campaigns and to keep consistency, we, um, we ensure that our templates are consistent with accurate messaging throughout the channels. Yes, our influencers can create, um, <clears throat> can create their own content, but the content is vetted through our um, community health department, which has expertise in HIV, STI prevention, and um, service Women Walker services. So to ensure that we link folks to care and providing accurate information, they do have free reign over um, the topics that they want to address, but we support them to ensuring the consistency across the board. The consistency is the way also to ensure that we are keeping our audiences engaged and keeping our audiences informed of accurate information. Um, <clears throat> we recruit influencers about about three, our budget allows for about three influencers to interact consistent weekly engagements to ensure that um, there is a consistent presence in the, space, in the space, so it's not lacking. So on their platform, they bring Whitman Walker into their space as a community partner, um, just to know that it is truly a partnership with them as um, a trusted member of the audience of our priority populations. As we all know, um, peer to peer, peer to peer education is one of the most prominent evidence-based um, interventions in public health. So we continue that to our, um, we sh as we do it in person, our outreach is in person, we continue to share that within our social media platform. And just like, it's just worked for us very well. Next slide, please. So we have, um, we have budgets, we have staff support, in um, fees for influencers, as you know, we are either nonprofit or federally qualified health center. We are heavily grant grant funded and through volunteers. I mean, donations that do Whitman Walker Health.org um, for us to continue the work that we do. So those funds do contribute to um, supporting our influencer programs and ensuring that um, they're compensated for the work that they're doing. 
because it's important to validate the work that they're doing um, and to support them in continuing the work. Because this is work that they do, that they do naturally, they're naturally passionate about. So putting funding behind that really increases um, their reach and allows them to build content uh, <clears throat> that helps for, for their audiences to grow. And our, our community health members also contribute to influence as to be influencers as they are already um, experts in the subject matter experts. So they do share the platforms with our um, external partners, our external influencers, to ensure that that information is accurate and is delivered into the diversify the space so that folks that we are reaching see themselves in health in healthcare and can see that it is accessible and just breaking down those barriers that are frequently seen amongst our priority populations. And as I mentioned before, our metrics, it's something that um, between our engaged users, our impressions, our reaches, our live views, these are all um, analytics that are accessible to us on the apps that we use. So it's important to ensure that um, just a quick, it's, a, it's, it's absolutely tangible for organizations, especially healthcare organizations to um, utilize a social media platform to promote public health, especially during um, COVID-19, um, <clears throat> showed that that much more, the importance of it. Okay. Is that, is there another slide there, Rama? Yes, there is. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to kind of show you all um, another Another great tool for engagement, as you know, folks, it's hard to keep um, attention spans, right? So it's important to ensure that you're giving information that is easily digestible and you're appealing to um, all literacy levels, you know, um, the basic literacy level of folks, and then um, ensure that someone is on your website constantly or your social media platforms that can support and answer questions that audience members may have, making yourself available to folks as you would for in-person, face-to-face outreach events. So kind of just translating those same efforts and that same visibility into the social media space. And we saw infographics were a great tool that we use to ensure that our audiences kind of they have information they can retain and keep as um, social media has grown. This is a strategy that everyone uses. So it's important to make sure that um, you, your content is precise, it's accurate, and it's attention grabbing. Focus on your audience and tailor your information to your audience. So thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Hello, this is Alex Walker. Uh, I had technical difficulties. We are going to extend today's webinar by 10 minutes. A couple Rama and Elaine, I don't know if you can also give us 10 more minutes of your time. Uh, we understand if you can't, but for those of you who are able to, we're going to spend the 10 more minutes and try to get in some of these great questions about there's such rich presentations. I, I definitely recommend checking out Women Walker's social profiles to get a sense of what Rama was talking about. Um, they're active on all of them. Their Instagram Live and TikToks are great. So. We are going to jump right into the Q and A, and we'll talk about as many as many questions as we can for ten minutes. And anything else, we'll try to answer in uh, a Q and A that we send out in a follow up email to everyone who registered. All right. So the first question uh, that we have is, what forums work best to reach parents? That was what, you know, one of the impetus for this webinar was trying to reach parents around COVID-19 vaccination. Um, I guess that's sort of a forums, platforms, social channels question. Elena, you want to dive in? Yeah, I think that Maura, you know, alluded to this earlier where it depends on where you're at in your demographics. So if you know that the, the people in your community, let's say you want to reach people in a specific community and you know that they are on Facebook, uh, then you want to reach them on Facebook. You want to make sure that, you know, like, for example, LinkedIn is a professional platform where you find business professionals. Uh, so the same way with the younger generation, let's say millennial moms, 
you want to make sure that you are on Instagram and sharing Instagram stories and reels versus Facebook, I would say is more of a community where um, if you want to reach my uh, commu Hispanic community, you want to go to Facebook, we're usually there, um, and it's very multi-language, so you can reach them in Spanish or reach us in Spanish, um, and also uh, older moms like I am as well, <laughs> moms of teenagers, you're always going to find them also on Facebook as well, but, but it really, there's not a true science for all of this, but you want to Take, take these things into your considerations because you want to reach the ideal audience where they're at. Anything else, Maura, that you think I missed? I, I think also it's really about the resources that you have as an organization and thinking about what platform is going to be easiest for you. You know, if there's someone on staff who's willing to make great TikTok videos, that's amazing. Um, if that's not something that you as an organization feel you can do, maybe then you want to work with influencers who are on TikTok, so they TikTok, TikTok, um, so that they can get your message out to an audience on TikTok when you aren't, right? If you want to build your community on Facebook, your own page, then maybe you want to work with influencers who are on Facebook and have them drive people to your page and drive page like. So it's also thinking about your goals um, as Ramo was talking about and where you want to build traffic and audience. So on your organic social channels and then how influencers can help. Uh -huh. and Instagram is a super visual platform. And so you have to create a lot of visuals, right? And so is that something that is going to be challenging? Thank you. And Elena, thank you. You sort of answered another question we had, which is about um, reaching Spanish speaking audiences um, another question that came in is, you know, for people in more rural areas, um, are influencers a, a relevant, a useful tactic if you're in a city of, is there, is there a, a population size that you can, that you, is a threshold before you can think about using social media influencers? It can it be a, 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 a small rural town versus a city of 200,000? It's just hard to I say. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think it really depends. And that's where you want to get, honestly, just get it searching, like get out those hashtags, start with the hashtag of your locality, um, start, you know, just playing around. And um, the other thing is that the, the definition of influencer can be very broad. It can be someone who owns a local business. It can be people who are in, you know, the local rotary. I think that, especially if your community is smaller, getting creative with the definition of an influencer. It could be someone who runs a newsletter group, for example, um, is, is, you know, is flexible based on your needs. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I, I to, yes, I, I wanted to add that, you know, influencer is not online also, only. I think, you know, at, sometimes I, I am engaged to go to a particular group and address them. So it's also leveraging that in person or, you know, small group community. Um, and, and definitely it depends on what you want to address in there, but that, that also is a, um, an option. Yeah. I would, oh, yeah, I was going to ask you to, yep. <laughs> I would say, um, everyone uses the internet if they have access to it. So I think, again, there isn't one way of doing something. If you have the resources to diversify, um, even if you are in a rural community, and yes, do the hashtag, see who's online, who are the common folks, the common internet um, faces, the influencers, quote unquote, um, in your area. But it wouldn't, if you can, if you have the resources to do so, a presence online, typically just won't hurt depending, especially if your social services that you're trying to um, advertise. Like that's how like marketing is key for any services you're trying to provide. So, and I think that um, like they mentioned, influencers definitely translates. It's not just folks online, it's community-based organizations, community partners, that physical presence is also important. So starting online may get you those partnerships that are outside of um, the digital realm. Uh, someone asks, do you have to post that you're looking for a paid partnership when when um, recruiting influencers? 
when we recruit, as I mentioned, we recruit from our typically our volunteers list, um, <clears throat> organizations that we've partnered with in the past to do outreach events or our walks in HIV, people that have been present and just um, voluntarily kind of share their time with Women Walker because they're passionate about the work that we do um, and you know the communities that we serve. But however, um, recently with our new round, we did post that, hey, I know we had a, a round of influencers. This is a new program. We've been on it for two years. We're looking for new faces, new community members, just to advertise that that is happening in the space. And folks who are on our list serve will reach out to us directly, like people who miss that we are recruiting. But we also actively approach people. Um, we're always doing outreach for influencers. <laughs> it's just embedded into our um, day to day, essentially. Okay, thank you. I was going to say that Maura said the one what's in it for me. So if it's not compensated with money, but, you know, when you approach an influencer, then, you know, talk about how it's going to benefit the audience, how it's going to benefit the influencer and exactly what you're looking to get out of it. I think that clarity is great when you're approaching uh, so that doesn't get lost in translation. <laughs> uh Rama, we have a question for you. Can you talk more about budgeting for this type of campaign? What do you base the compensation on? Hours spent, number of posts? Um, we spent it on, so we have it broken up on, there's a contract, you know, when you come in or our job description is there, how often you are online and how much you post. It's about three, con 10 hours a week is our um, goal. And that could be through lives, reposting and content creation. And depending on if there's a specific campaign or there's a specific push, those hours might increase in that week because your presence is needed or, you know, things like that. So it all budgeting it out really is typically 10 hours a week per influencer if we have three influencers on staff. That's very useful. Thank you. Okay, I think we're going to have to wrap it up there. Uh, if people have other questions that weren't answered, put them in the chat and we will see if we can send out, uh, like I said, a Q&A as a follow-up email. Uh, I want to say thank you to Rama, Elena, and Maura for giving us your time and expertise. Uh, we're hoping that attendees feel like you have another tool in your toolbox. And as was mentioned, this is this is a second in a series of four educational opportunities. The next one is next Wednesday, the 26th. Information about it is on NAC.org. And then we have another opportunity in February, and you'll be getting that in a follow-up email too. So thanks everyone for your Thank time you. and your commitment. Have a good day.